it's arrogant to say that Jesus is the only way. The Bible's full of contradictions. It's my body, so it's my choice. How can we best answer the top objections today to Christianity? Perhaps more than anyone else, our guest today, Greg Kokel, has not only helped me think about these issues in terms of content, but how to defend my faith tactically. His book, Tactics, is a must-read. In fact, in our Bioapologetics program, Greg, we have you teach a full weekend class on that. It's so pivotal. You've got a new book out that's kind of part two called Street Smarts that that's has right. the subtitle, Using Questions to Answer Christianity's Toughest Challenges. Mm -hmm. So in this one, we're going to look at 10 of the top objections, but rather than answer all of them in depth, just kind of maybe walk through how you approach these questions, so to speak, okay. to help us better navigate when they come up. Does mm -hmm. that sound good? That it does, and it just want to say it's a treat to be with you, Sean. You know, we've oh, got a man. long history together, and uh, we, do. we hardly ever get together anymore because we each got our lives going in, uh, in different directions, whatever. But it's so it's nice to connect with you here on the show. Well, likewise, so, and I'm thrilled about your new book. So maybe just start before we jump in, we're going to take these kind of one through ten. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could jump in and just tell us, what are you doing in this book? What's the approach you take in mm -hmm. Street Smarts? Okay. Uh, what Street Smarts is, is uh, a sequel of sorts to the Tactics book. Now, the Tactics book has been out for about 13 or 14 years. Wow. We had a new edition uh, about four years ago, whatever, 10th anniversary edition. And um, in that, uh, the subtitle is A Game Plan for discussing your Christian convictions. Mm. So what I've, uh, I've done in that book is I've uh, put together a kind of a three-step approach to engaging people in a productive way that's very relaxed. It lends itself to genial conversation, but it's very, very effective. And it, the feedback I've gotten, Sean, has been fabulous over the years that this yeah. has really transformed people's ability to engage in conversations, even if they're like ordinary folk. They're not apologists, they're not philosophers, they're not theologians. They wanted tools that will help them to engage uh, in a way that was safe for them and mm -hmm. also provided uh, an opportunity to get another person thinking. So in my approach, we're not trying to co close the deal here. We're not swinging for the fences. We're not trying to get people to pray to receive Christ. We're trying to help them along the journey a little bit. This is what I call gardening as opposed yeah. to harvesting, right? Yep. Okay, so this is a gardening approach, and the tactical game plan is a gardening tool, okay? And, of course, without good gardening, you're not going to have a harvest. So this is to help get many people into play, but in a safe way. And the key to the tactical approach is using questions. Mm. For a number of reasons, this is a valuable way to approach it. For one, when you're using questions, it puts you in the driver's seat of the conversation, so to speak. Okay. Yep. So you can direct the conversation just like you're doing right now, Sean, <laughs> by asking the questions that direct the program. The same thing in personal conversations with people. Uh, but uh, they're also polite. They're drawing people out. They're getting their point of view. Um, but one of the biggest advantages of questions, Sean, is that questions keep you safe. Hmm. So let's say I encounter an atheist or, or an LGBTQ person or whatever, and, hmm. and here I am, okay, I've got an opportunity. Now what? Well, if I start preaching at them, I can get myself into a lot of trouble, you know, because that invites their a contrary response. No, it isn't. Yep. You're wrong. You're bigoted, whatever. But if I just begin asking questions of them, I'm not revealing my side. I'm actually trying to find out more about their side. That puts me in a safe position. But as you'll see, it's possible to use questions in a very shrewd fashion mm. to make progress, even when you're not preaching your side. Now, that's the key to the Columbo. I call it Columbo because of Lieutenant Columbo. Of course, might yeah. remember from yep. TV, the bumbling guy with the cigar, you know, and he never yeah. looks like he knows what he's doing, but man, he's in total control. He knows mm. what he's doing and he gets the job done by asking questions that don't seem to be very uh, challenging or whatever to people it comes in under the radar. So that's kind of the posture we're talking about here. Friendly, genial, safe for the Christian. Mm. And uh, there are three steps to the game plan. And I, I want to chart these out because as we talk, 
yep. all three steps, all three steps are going to be employed. Okay. Though the new book, uh, Street Smarts, is really focused on expanding on the third use of Columbo. Okay. okay. So th the first use of Columbo, in other words, the first kind of Columbo question that we're going to use when we converse with people has a simple goal. All we're going to do is gather information. It's all we're going to do. We just, we just want to get the lay of the land in a conversation. We may not know if that person's a Christian or not. We may not know what their views are about whatever, you know, but if we're looking for an opportunity maybe to be effective for Christ, we can just start drawing people out with simple questions. You do this on the airplane when you travel around just like I do, and, and you just see what happens, see what the lay of the land is. Okay. And, and that, and, and this is um, also really valuable when you're encountering somebody who is in direct opposition to your view. You're already in a conversation of some sort, and they're coming after you with a challenge or an objection. Okay. The first model question to gather the information we need is very simple. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? And you'll see in the illustrations that follow. I'm going to be doing that a lot. Now, it gives us some advantage when we do that. First of all, someone's coming on to us, we can ask for more clarification. That puts the ball back in their court and gives us a little breathing time. We can think a little bit about what's going sure. on. Yeah, that's smart. It also forces the other person to be more clear about their own challenge. Hmm. A lot of times, Sean, people make challenges and they really haven't thought about them. They've I just agree. kind of been socialized, right? You know, they pick it up from the street and they toss it out and they haven't thought about it. And so mm -hmm. when we force them to think about it by asking, what do you mean by that? Or, or some version of that question, then, um, then they've got to think about it. And um, it's amazing how often you ask a person for clarity and they can't give you clarity. Okay? I, I have found that many times. Yeah. So, so that'll be our first step. We're going to get information okay. asking, what do you mean by that? And you're going to see how that how tactically that can actually work even with a hostile challenge. Okay. Uh, the second thing is um, the, what we, what I call reversing the burden of proof. Okay. Now what, what the objector wants us to do is to defend our video. They're coming after us. All right. Um, what we're going to ask them to do when they offer a view is to defend their own view. Got it. The basic rule is if a person makes mm -hmm. a claim, then the burden of proof is upon them. Okay. Uh, and, and, and if they, especially if it's controversial, you know, and this is common, you know, you say something bizarre is true, or the DA knocks on your door and said, you, you robbed the bank, you know, what do you get to say? You get to say, prove it. They make the claim. So the burden of proof is on them. The person who makes the claim bears the burden. Okay. So those are two steps where first we're going to find out what the person believes to get more clarity on that and why they believe it. Okay, so that's the first two basic steps. Now, the third step is different. It's an advanced step, and that's the focus of Street Smarts. The third step is we're going to use questions to make a point, actually. We're going to make a point about our view, or more specifically with this book, we're going to try to show a weakness or a flaw in the challenge the other person is offered. Mm. And therefore we're kind of parrying the challenge on the one hand and in parrying the challenge, we're giving an opportunity for making our case look stronger in their eyes. Now, keep in mind, just, I want to reinforce this, making our case look stronger. See, we're not going for the gold here. We're not swinging for the fences. We're not trying to prove Christianity is true. We're trying to put a stone in their shoe trying to give them something to think about. We want to annoy them a little bit in a good way and think about Christ or the issue. And they may be thinking about something positive about Christianity. They may be thinking about something for the first time negative about their own view that they've just offered. So that's what I'm after here in this whole process. And when people begin to push back with challenges, I want to get clarity on their view. I want to understand why they think that particular view is 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 a uh, is credible their view that's the reasons for their view and then i want to because i have some understanding about what's wrong with the atheistic worldview or uh the the pro-choice position with regards to abortion or the charge that that uh that that christianity or bringing god into science is a science stopper for example or all the, i know there are things wrong with those 
views or those challenges. And the book goes into a lot of detail does, showing, yeah. showing what's wrong. But the purpose of seeing what's wrong is not to be able to say, well, you're wrong for this reason. The right. purpose of seeing what's wrong is to know the, the liabilities of that person's point of view and then form questions that can probe and draw that person out and help them to see the problems with their view. Okay, gotcha. so that's that's the basic approach here, and maybe as we jump into uh, yeah some of these issues, I can um, you know step aside from our, our role play a little exactly. bit and then say here's what I'm doing and here's what I'm after, etc. And uh, we'll see how this works. Well, I love it. So we have record of Jesus asking 339 questions, sure. Paul asking 262. And there's such a strategy that you lay out in this book. So I'm not mm -hmm. asking you to answer all of these exhaustively. On each right, one right. of these, I have multiple videos. But just model for us maybe a question or two you would ask how mm -hmm. to navigate this, I think yeah. would be really interesting. So let's dive in really in no particular order. But uh, mm -hmm. what I'll call objection number one, the Bible is full of contradictions. How would you apply some of these strategies when faced with that challenge? Okay, so Sean, now I'm treating you, Sean, as the objector, so I'm in okay. role play no. So Sean, I'm, explain what you're getting at here. Why is that important? What What is the problem here? Now, by the way, that's Columbo number one. What do you mean by that? That's all it is. I'm just drawing you out for more information. Mm. Well, if there's contradictions, then clearly the Bible's not the inerrant word of God. Okay. Well, you're right. If there are serious contradictions that are that are quantifiable, well, then we got a problem there. But Sean, that's not the case I'm making right here, okay? I don't want to make the case for you that the Bible is the Word of God, okay? Because my convictions are not my, about Christianity and Jesus are not based on that, okay? What, what my convictions are based on is the reliability, historically, of the details of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Do you, have you read some of the New Testament or, or some of the accounts of Jesus' life? I have, and so okay. that's fair about it being inspired, but if it's contradictory, then how do we know it's reliable? If Matthew and Mark are differing on certain accounts, wouldn't that mm -hmm. undermine the reliability? So are you saying that if someone contradicts another person's, uh, say, account of something happened, then the event didn't happen itself? I'm saying it takes away our confidence in knowing that the event happened when some of the key sources we rely upon contradict so blatantly. Well, wait, let me ask you a question about that, though, Sean. Notice, by the way, this is all Columbo number one. That's all we're doing right here. Mm. Uh, and I'm leading now into Columbo number three. So I I'm just got some clarification. But there's a problem with what you just said. You just basically said that um, if you have contradictory accounts, then you can't trust the event that is is, is being reported on. Okay, so um, let's just say there is a contradictory account that you're involved with in something that you did. You went to a party last night and you said somebody was there and another person says, no, that person wasn't there. So we have a contradictory report about the party last night. Does that mean because there's some particular detail that's contradicted that the party or the salient details of the party never took place? Is that what that means, Sean? Uh, I got to admit, Greg, I didn't expect this conversation <laughs> going this direction. <laughs> I love it. You're making me think on the other side. This is kind of fun it's while we exactly do it. Exactly the I... point. <laughs> I notice, and so let me step aside for a moment. Notice yeah. the underlying presumption. If there is a contradiction, we haven't established that there is, but right. if there is, that means the account is not reliable. Now, right. you and I have a good friend, Jay Warner Wallace. Yep. Cold case, cold case Christianity, the cold case detective. Mm -hmm. He likes the idea that the gospel accounts do not seem, in some cases, to completely agree. That for him is a is a um, is a an earmark of authenticity. If everybody right. that saw an event agreed on every detail of that event, that would sound like collusion. But the fact is, at any event, people have different perspectives and they see different things than other people see. And when they report on it, they give maybe not always contradictory um, uh, reports about it, but sometimes they're, they're just inconsistent with each other. OK, well, so what? Does that mean that we are not able to determine the truth of the matter about 
important details of that particular event in question? Well, of course not. And this is how he's able to, J. Warner Wallace, solve crimes and assess eyewitness testimony. The, as it turns out, the eyewitness testimony in the New Testament of the various events are, you know, they just, this is what convinced him to leave atheism and become a Christian. Yeah. The, the simple point, the background point here is the Bible doesn't have to have complete consistency in all of its historical accounts in order to be, um, for those accounts to be reliable in reporting the details of the event. Okay. You can have three different characterizations of a car crash. That doesn't mean the car didn't crash. Right. And so say, for instance, with the resurrection of Christ, we have these various details about the resurrecting morning, who went, where, when, how, and all that. You read different accounts and it, and you get what seem to be variations. Now, I actually think when you make a much closer look, um, they're not contradictory. They're just giving you different facets of what happened that morning. Okay. And that's another issue, you know, sure. whether there sure. really is a contradiction, but even if it appears that the accounts are not consistent with each other, does that mean that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that the central feature of those accounts is not true. And that actually doesn't follow. And that's why what I'm going to do is to make the point with you by bringing up a, an illustration from your own life or experience or whatever to show we wouldn't do that in most events in life. We wouldn't just dismiss them if there appeared to be a contradiction. But I, I don't want your listeners to miss really my main strategy in dealing with the Bible contradiction ones. I'm not going to try to prove to non-Christians that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God. This is a monumental task, and you don't need to do that. The early Christians, those in the first century, especially the, the first uh, 15, 20, 30 years, they didn't have an inerrant Bible to refer to. They had people who gave an account of the life of Jesus of Nazareth, things that were done in history, and that was the foundation for their faith. It's interesting when you see in the book of Acts, the, uh, the Luke writing, he's talking about, and then they spoke the word, and they spoke the word, and they were speaking the word and preaching the word. But when you look closely, they weren't quoting Bible verses. They were summarizing the accounts of, of, of the life of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus and their personal uh, interaction with him and their eyewitness testimony of the resurrection and that he fulfilled prophecy and things like that. And that taken as a whole was counted by Luke in that context as the word of God. That is the message of the mm. gospel explained in terms that people could understand. No inerrant Bible at that point, Old Testament, yes, but with the Jews, with the Gentiles, that didn't matter. And so what you had was a reliable accounting of the salient historical uh, events themselves. And that's what really matters for us, not an inerrant Bible. I do believe in inerrancy, just so there's no confusion. Yeah, of course, of course. But we don't enough. have to prove that in order to make the case that uh, that Christianity is true. It's a true characterization of the world. Great response. I suppose if there's some skeptics and atheists watching right now, they could say, Sean, I could raise better contradictions and steel man this thing. Fair enough. Our goal okay. is to draw out from your book the strategies that you use, how you focus and use mm -hmm. questions and respond to the common objections that come up. Mm -hmm. And you do a great job doing that in the book. And I appreciate actually in the book you lay out these kind of scripts, not that it's formulaic as if you say A, the person says B, but to yeah. just try to teach here's a question you can ask here's how to better navigate this. And the more that you read, the better you become at doing so. So let's try another one okay. and uh, walk us through again. So Greg, come on. The Trinity contradicts. How so? Well, you're by the saying way, notice there's... That's a, that's, a, that's a, what do you mean by that? There's a Columbo one. Don't tell me more. It, okay. how, how does it contradict? Well, you're saying there's one God mm -hmm. and three gods. So if you say there's one God, Jesus is God, that's one. Father's God, that's two. Holy Spirit's God, that's three. How can there okay. be one and three? Okay, you actually asked two questions there. Okay, first had to do with my belief, and the second one had to do with how can there be one and three. So let me take them in reverse, okay? okay. Um, how many, how many uh, people in your family? 
Uh, depends on how you define family. Immediate family, no, no, we'll say just five. Immediate family. We're not going to be tricky <laughs> with this. Okay. Five? You have three kids? I do. Oh, I didn't know that. You went extra than I recall. Okay. Okay. So you have five kids in one family, right? Five people in one family. Yeah. Five people. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Five people. Five in one. You can't have five in one. It's a contradiction. Well, there's a difference between saying there's five the, the term family and the term people is different in this example than it is in the trinity okay let's let, let's set the trinity aside just for a moment sean because i'm going to the last thing you said three and one is a contradiction so i just gave you an example of five and one your family okay but you realize that's not a contradiction why isn't five and one in your family not a contradiction so what i said or thought i said was three and one is a contradiction if you said there's one god and there's three gods that's three and there's okay. one that's a contradiction i okay. agree with you that a team could have multiple members but one team okay good so in other words if the way if the way when you're talking this use your family if the way that the family it, it, yeah, the, if the way you have one thing is different from the way you have five things in your case, that's not a contradiction. You have one family and five members. You have one and five. Okay, okay. not contradiction. So now I'll go to the Trinity. And by the way, that's not an illustration of the Trinity that I just gave. I'm just making the sure, point that sure. you can have a three and one that's not a contradiction right. if the three is different than the one, okay? Yep. So your understanding of the Trinity then is that we are saying there is one God and there are three gods. Is that your understanding? Yeah, it seems pretty clear if Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are each God, that's three gods. Yes. Well, you didn't take it far enough, though. And this is maybe just a misunderstanding that a lot of people have. Okay. What we are saying is that there is one God who has three centers of consciousness in the one God. Okay, no, I admit that's kind of weird. <laughs> but I just, I, I, I work with me on this. One God, three centers of consciousness. One what, three who's. Just like one family, five members, okay? One what, three who's, okay? So if it turns out that our view is one God, three persons, how is that contradictory? Okay, so take a step back, and uh, that's a good distinction. I'm not honestly sure how I would, I would answer that one because your point is to say clearly that the oneness and the threeness are different. different. Exactly. So and it seems like here. you used the humor to admit we're talking about something kind of that goes beyond our imagination, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think that was the point of the humor that you used, mm -hmm. but now you're distinguishing between oneness and and threeness exactly. minimally there's not a contradiction so your strategy yeah. is just to show there's not a contradiction because my That's claim was it directly contradicted is that exactly. right exactly so yes so this is merely a deflection obviously i'm not going to okay. prove to the the naysayer that the trinity is true a, a true characterization mm -hmm. of god all right um th that has to do with biblical revelation okay um but what he has done is offered a defeater he said, your view can't be true because of it's, it's a contradiction. It turns out it's not a contradiction, though, okay, if you understand it properly. Now, I could have just communicated that to him. No, it's not a con contradiction. You misunderstand it. We have three persons in one God. It's not contradictory. But what am I doing there? I'm kind of lecturing him about why he's wrong. Mm. Instead, I took the tack that's much more genial, I think, that uh, of asking questions getting you to clarify your point, mm. it's participatory. And then, you know, at the end, of course, I'm making it clear that on our view, there is no contradiction, if he understands mm. our view accurately. And that's all I want, excuse me, that's all I wanted me to say is that, oh, I guess it's not a contradiction. Um, hold on just a second, because I, <laughs> oh man, I got people sending me messages. I just quit that thing, so. No worries, no ding, worries. Ding. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, You're so that, in that particular case, I'm just parrying an objection. 
I'm not making my case. I'm rather showing that their objection is not a good, a sound objection. Okay, so while while you were pushing back on my role play, I thought of other objections that I could raise. Okay. But then that would be shifting the question now beyond the original claim that I made that the Trinity contradicts. That's so right. presumably if I did that, you would have said, okay, let's talk about that. But do you agree with me at least minimally that there's no contradiction when we properly understand what Christian teach by the Trinity, sure. kind of narrate it for them, then move yeah. on to the next question. Is that how you exactly. would navigate that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Frequently. Now, sometimes, I mean, that is very, very important. You use the term narrating what's going on. It's excellent. Okay. Uh, sometimes what just happened was so obvious that there's no need to narrate. It's just like even when we were doing a role play and I asked you, so if we're talking about one God with three centers of consciousness, how is that a contradiction? And mm. you were, you had no place to go because it's not. That doesn't mean it's true. And and I jokingly pointed out that's kind of weird. I get it, mm. but it's not a contradiction. And so if if something is really obvious, the point I've made, you don't have to belabor it. But sometimes you do want to get that commitment. Okay, we've resolved that issue, right? Okay, so what's next? Okay, kind of that's thing. super helpful. Now I want to just reiterate again. Each one of these, there's so much more we could go down and defend. We're not pretending to completely put these objections to rest, right, right. but just walking through the reasoning that you're teaching people to do in this book. Mm -hmm. So it's more really of a how book, so to speak, although you get some of the answers embedded within it, you find a way to do both together. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, Let's, you can't you can't exploit the weaknesses of somebody else's view with questions unless you know the weaknesses. And so a lot of time mm. is spent in the book uh, focusing on that before we work into the model dialogues and, and the questions that, that move you forward in a friendly conversation. Love it. All right, let's try another one. Okay. Uh, the Bible endorses slavery. How can you believe in a God and a book that allows something that or it endorses something that we know is clearly wrong. Let me ask you a question, Sean. Um, when you hear the word slavery, what picture comes to mind for you? I think of just a human being owning another human being in any capacity. Mm -hmm. So does it kind of conjure up... Uh, you know, American slave trade, for example, where people are kidnapped and dragged across the ocean and many died and got tossed into the ocean and are exchanged as chattel property and have no rights and the owners can do anything they want with them and that kind of thing. Is that what you yeah, have in mind? That's certainly kind. I think there's other kinds of slavery we would condemn, mm -hmm. even some of the stuff we see in the Bible, like in Exodus 18, you can beat a slave. Uh, so yes, it includes that, although there might be other kinds of slavery I would reject right, as well. Right. So I, I just want to focus on this one thing before we get to the Bible thing, because okay. um, uh, I think part of the concern here, part of the problem, is an image that we have of what slavery entails when we hear that word, okay? Now, uh, do you know the—I guess you you sounds like you've studied it a little bit because you know something about you know, the uh, Deuteronomy 18. Okay. Do you know what the Hebrew word for slave is? Uh, tell me. It's Ebed, E-B-E-D. Okay, the Anglicized version. You know what the Hebrew word for servant is? Uh, tell me. Same thing. Ebed. In other words, <laughs> the same word mm. translated servant is translated slave. Now that ought to give us pause. Um, in fact, when you go to translations of the Bible that are hundreds of years old, like the King James Version, the word ebed was almost always translated servant. This might suggest that what we have in the scriptures mm. is not the same kind of thing that most people think about when they, uh, when they think about the word slavery. They, they think about the American system and all the evils that were associated with them. Although I understand, like you said, there are different types of slavery, but in any event, that's what comes to mind. Did you know um, that in uh, Mosaic Law, since you've studied this a little bit, apparently, did you know that kidnapping, which is central to the slave system in America, was a capital crime? Did you know that, Sean? Mm -hmm. 
I did. Yeah. I got to admit, it's a little awkward that you're calling me Sean and I'm role playing somebody else's <laughs> character here. <laughs> so well, I'm trying to think, well, do, well, I, I don't, I have no idea, but let's, okay. <laughs> no, you should keep doing that. I just had to okay. narrate it a yeah. little bit. Um, I Cause I thinking, did. Hey, I, I don't believe that. <laughs> of course I know that. I've, uh, I've, I've got a PhD in this stuff, you know? No, that, well, I'm, yeah. I'm, but I've just, fair uh, enough. So, so let me, let me take, let's take a step back and unpack your approach to this. So I'm challenging okay. that the Bible endorses slavery mm -hmm. at raising the question and your first approach, you asked a question and then you asked me to just explain what we mean by slavery. Tell Actually, us yeah. why you started there. Well, because when people object to slavery, I think what they're, what they are, the, the, when they see the word slavery in there, an image comes to mind. And the image is the image of slavery in the American and the British system in other parts of the world too. But this is the image most accessible to us of people being kidnapped, being taken against their will, being s carried across the sea in terrible circumstances, being raped, being um, murdered. If, if those who were responsible for the slaves uh, thought this was appropriate in the circumstance and sold into a uh, chattel um, uh, bondage in a way that they had no rights or no privileges or no protections of any kind. Okay, so that's the picture. And so I'm raising the question then as to whether that kind of slavery is the kind of thing that the Bible is actually endorsing. And it turns out it's not. But I could preach that, so to speak, or I could begin mm. asking questions like the one I just asked. Did you know that kidnapping was a capital crime? You kidnap somebody uh, in order to make them a slave or to have them serve you in any way, that's a capital crime under the Mosaic law. So the Bible forbids kidnapping. Mm. Rape was a capital crime. Murder was a capital crime. And even in the cases where there was the, the, uh, the servants that could be beaten even. I mean, kids could be beaten in the Bible. You know, uh, you, see, you see language like that, that uh, in, in the book of Proverbs and other places as well. Now, what, what I don't think it means is that they can be tortured, tormented, whatever. What we normally think of when we talk sure. about getting a beating. You know, right. um, they can be disciplined, physically disciplined, but even children uh, could be physically dis disciplined in Scripture. So um, this is one of the most difficult issues to deal with because of all the images that go along with it. And plus, you have a circumstance in uh, in ancient Near Eastern culture that w was abominable. And God is taking the, a people, the Jews, in that environment, and he is, he is trying to put protections on a practice that was practiced by everybody, everybody in the world at that time, okay? But here's the importance and the difference between uh, a slave and a servant, even though they're both from the same word. The, the so-called slaves, many of them were indentured servants. How could a person take care of himself if he didn't have personal means? He had to hire himself out to somebody else. And how did he do that? He became their servant or slave. He became their ebed. And, uh, and so uh, this word pops up in the, in the scriptures as a, uh, as, a, as a description of an economic arrangement. And what ends up happening is people read into it a whole set of circumstances that don't apply there. Okay. What I like to say is that um, so-called slaves in the, uh, in, in the Mosaic law had um, union representation. <laughs> okay. And that was Moses and it was his union representative and uh, because they had rights. They had they got one day off a week just like everybody else the sabbath was the day of rest okay uh you could not if you really beat a slave you knocked his tooth out you had to set him free this is all part of the law so when you look more closely at the circumstances of the mosaic law with regards to slavery what you see is a very very different set of circumstances than what is suggested by the word slavery when people okay. in the 21st century read the word. 
Okay, so 13 years ago, I had my first public debate on God and morality. And afterwards, a professor came up to me. He's an atheist. And he said to me, he said, how can you be Christian when God allows you to beat your slave in Exodus 18? Mm -hmm. I said to him, I said, hey, since you're local and so am I, let's get coffee and talk about this. And you. so we went out to coffee, sat down probably two hours, became friends. It was awesome. And I said, I'm happy to go to Exodus 18 if you can answer two questions for me. Number one, how you get an objective moral law that humans ought to follow first. Right. Second, how you get human value. Because you didn't ask me about enslaving ants or rocks. It's about human beings. <laughs> if you can explain those two things, then we get to Exodus 18. And we never got to Exodus 18. Right. So. I don't want to, I want to honor somebody's question, but I also don't want to concede to the objector certain ground that I think their worldview doesn't allow them to have. Right Now, right, I agree. in this case, you took a different strategy, but you've obviously thought through how you want to respond to slavery and feel like distinguishing in somebody's mind between biblical slavery and the uh, concept they probably have of chattel slavery that needs to be disentangled. Right, That's the right. heart of your approach when this comes up, right? That's right. But the other point you made is a really important one, and I deal with that in other chapters. Because, okay. um, it, 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 and that could have been an angle I took. My concerns, if I took that angle, is someone would think, I, would think I'd be sidestepping the larger issue. And I don't want them to think I'm doing that. But your point is a good one. And that is, what is your basis for objection, given your atheism, given, you, given your materialistic mm. view of reality? Um, and of course, there is no basis of objection. What, what moral principle inherent to atheism disallows human slavery? The answer is there is none, because there is no moral principle inherent to atheism at all. Mm. There are no moral principles. Now, atheists can adopt principles if they want, and they do. So I'm not sure. saying that all atheists are immoral. Of course. I'm making the point that you're making, and that is, what is the basis, morally speaking, from your worldview that allows you to raise this kind of criticism? Or as I point out in the book, if somebody wants a question, mm. where are you getting your moral standards that you're using to judge mm. God by here in the Bible? And that's a question. So notice there's a little, yep. a little, uh, a little um, beat there, a silent moment. Yeah, they got to answer that. The problem is they can't, because they have no moral principles inherent to atheism that allows mm. them to criticize any behavior of any kind. By the way, they don't have any moral principles that allows them to commend any behavior as objectively moral, mm. either. You lose both bad and good in an atheistic, naturalistic worldview. Now, they do have an end around, and I do talk about that in the book. Maybe we'll get to that. But the basic principle here is, if you're going to judge somebody morally, you have to have a foundation or a grounds by which you can do that. You're judging Christianity and the Bible and God of the Bible morally based on what standard? That's the question mm -hmm. you are asking, essentially, of your friend, and that's a really good one. Let's try a few more. We probably won't get to all 10, but uh, this is fun. I'm, I, I'm enjoying this. How about this common one that comes up? Uh, well, believing in God is a science stopper. If you say God caused something, that prevents us from moving forward and finding a scientific explanation. So when you say a scientific explanation, what do you mean? I mean an explanation that we discover through the means of science. Okay, so that would be an explanation that that entails a materialistic cause and effect kind of thing, right? Here's some natural law that explains it. Is that right? Um, Notice these are these are just Columbo number one. I'm just getting clear, but I I do have a reason for asking these questions. Yeah, okay, I was trying so, to think through okay. where I wanted to commit myself or not. Yeah, but well, uh, that a was scientific answer. You have a certain yeah. sense. Sean, uh, so, or Fred, whatever you want me to call you. <laughs> so, uh, so what what does that look like? What does scientific answer look like to you? It means observing the natural world, the physical world, and explaining how things operate, uh -huh. rather than bringing in principles and things we can't see or touch 
or feel, hence something spiritual. Okay, so what if it turns out? I'm, I'm, I'm pausing a moment because there's a lot of different directions I could go here with this. Um, uh, what if it turns out that the thing that caused what you see was not caused by a natural force? Is that possible well, I, in your mind, Sean? Uh, it's logically possible, but I don't see a shred of evidence that that's the case. And if okay, we are you stop- about in terms of science? Okay, go ahead. Oh, no. Jump in. So, go for it. So, I mean, we're having a conversation, right? Mm hmm Okay. So you're using words in our conversation. What, mm -hmm. what, what natural physical laws are causing your mouth to say the things that they're saying right now? Well, they're coming from my body and through sound waves and who I am is oh, the cause of them. I, we could who? trace it back to my body. Okay, so your, your body is just causing this according to naturalistic laws? Yeah, I mean, there's no demon or angel behind the system no, here. No, we I'm can not actually uh, trace back. No, right. I'm, I'm actually drawing a parallel here. I'm not appealing to God or demons, but, but I am making an appeal to you. Are you creating your words and using your mouth to say the words to me? Uh, yeah, I am, but I'm just my body. Well, if you're just your body and you're reacting to, uh, and all you, all this is, is a series of events that are taking place. Um, how, how is it that, you, <laughs> let me just think how I want to put this. If you're just your body, then how is it that you have any freedom to choose the questions in response to me right now? Because well, the natural things, dominoes falling, that's natural law. So you're saying natural law is causing all the things, just causing you to say all the things you're saying? I mean, maybe we don't have freedom. Science has actually showed the way the world actually works. Hence, we want an explanation for the origin of the world that we know science can give us. Uh -huh. We bring in all these other things that you're talking about here. We've moved beyond science. So it's possible that I have free will. But okay, I don't so see just, why that's necessary. Well, well, if you don't, you just told me that science has shown. That means you've concluded that science has provided evidence that allows you to make this conclusion, the statements that science has shown, right? You concluded uh, yes. that. Okay, sure. well, uh, that confuses me because I thought what you just told me is that it is the forces of nature and science and uh, natural law and everything that is causing your mouth to move the way it's moving. Okay, so how can you have confidence in drawing a conclusion about something when you are determined by natural law to say the things you're saying or to think the things you're thinking? Well, that's where science comes in because there's peer review and claims can be tested against the empirical physical world. Sure. Okay. And maybe it see wasn't if clear. they actually match up. Okay. So, but I, I, maybe I wasn't clear in my response then. What you're doing here, what you just described, is a cognitive process, okay, where you're seeing and assessing based on the evidence. But what you described to me a few moments ago about the nature of the process. It's not a seeing and describing of the evidence, but merely a deterministic response based on stimulus from the environment. If you are determined, okay, then whatever you believe about science is not a result of the evidence of science. It's a result of the determination that governs your beliefs. Do you see the point I'm making? Uh, I do. Okay, so l let me jump in here. I, I feel okay. like I could keep pushing back yeah. on this and we could have this conversation for a while let's take a step back because you paused a couple times and thought i could go take this a few different directions yeah and one it seemed when i said god is a science stopper it mm -hmm. sounds like you were starting with the challenge of like trying to say who am i is this just chemicals in motion that's right thinking i might not just say oh i'm just a body and kind of bite the bullet on that uh -huh. one which makes sense and then you are going to make an analogy back towards if there's a self that can cause something that's not physical could there be a god that causes something that's not physical that that's was exactly the first right. route you were taking is that correct that's correct no that's right and i was trying to and what what this is 
demonstrates is these conversations can go in lots of different directions. That's right. They're not always really tidy. And you make decisions on the, on the run or on the fly, so to speak, about how you want to prosecute the conversation with questions. Because there are so many different things that occurred to me in the things you said that, that I could pursue here. But that was my main logic. Uh, you said there's no evidence for these invisible entities that might be influencing things like God or whatever. We have science, blah, 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 to make the determinations for us. And I, my point was, well, you are an invisible entity that's making things happen. You're making your mouth move. You're call, You're coming to conclusions based on evidence, none of which could happen in a meaningful way if you were determined as you suggested you might be. So you're an agent. You're not just one of the events that's taking place, not a series of dominoes falling. There's another approach I could have taken too. And, and that is I could have asked you, do you know how modern science started? Mm. Okay, so, um, and I go into quite a bit of detail on this in the book. Modern science started in the West, not in the East. It started in the West because there was a deep conviction that human beings were made by an intelligent creator to have capabilities of assessing their environment and making changes in their environment. They could discover truth because there was a God who made a world that made it possible for them to do that. Five senses, whatever. They have, they have accurate or reasonably accurate access to the world, and therefore they can dis discover things about the world that told them a little bit more about the one who made the world, okay? So simply put, the driving force, the driving worldview that started the whole scientific project was a Judeo-Christian worldview. With if they were if they were in India, and they believed that religiously that the world was an illusion, Maya, well they wouldn't have any motivation to want to examine the illusion, because they were born in the West. Most of them, the central fi figures of virtually every single um, discipline of science, they were almost every one of them a Bible-believing theist, okay? That's significant because it shows that God, the conviction that God was there and that he made a world a certain way, that was a science starter. It mm. wasn't the science stopper, okay? But I do have another question about this. I, I think you're right. Now I'm going back a little bit into a role play. I, I think science is great to be able to describe the way things happen in a natural realm. The problem is some things that can't be explained mm. even in principle by the kinds of ways science explains the world. Event causing event causing event according to natural law, okay? Like dominoes falling, illustration I use. So for example, um, you know probably a little bit about DNA, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Evolution, DNA, mutations, and all that. When you have a mutation of DNA, you have a change of the code. It produces a different kind of physical feature, right? And maybe that's mm -hmm. adapted better to survive. Okay. So there's a whole code, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the question. Who wrote the code? I mean, we know where code comes from because we live in a digital age. Uh, Bill Gates reminds us looking at DNA, that's code. And code comes from, from coders, from agents, people who make code. Okay, they write the code. So here's my question then, who wrote the code? Where did that code come from? Now, the problem is, and this is a little bit more of a sophisticated discussion. I mean, you can get into the details of the science. The problem is that you're, you're you're not going to be able to explain that because it's like explaining who, you know, who's, who, who wrote, who wrote the, what naturalistic process describes how all of these words in a different book that I wrote called Story of Reality came to be. No, it, they, no naturalistic process produced it, that. I wrote it. It took an agent to put those words in order to communicate useful information. Okay. That's the way information works. 
So my challenge at this point, Sean, is that, uh, and this is Sean McDowell, not Sean Fred, uh, not the role playing <laughs> Sean. My challenge at this point is to is to help people see that even though science, for in most cases, is perfectly adequate to explain um, the events that we see happening in the world, there are some circumstances that a naturalistic process simply cannot account for mm. all right and 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 when we look more closely at those processes like the dna code it bears all of the earmarks of intelligence all right so i'm just going to shift right now uh just to, to another question if you saw sean sean the the skeptic sean if you saw a footprint if you saw the shape of a shoe in the sand on the beach here in Southern California, what would you presume? Okay, l l let me jump in and make okay. some comments on where this conversation is going. Let me take us a few steps back. Okay. Because you you're right. One of the challenges is when, ch when questions come up, there's so many different avenues we can go on, and each has strengths, and each maybe has liabilities. Mm -hmm. So if we rewind to the back, believing in God is a science stopper, one of the first questions you asked was, uh, can you define what you mean by science, right? Mm -hmm. So right. the reason I'm narrating this is you are savvy in intelligent design, DNA. There's a lot of people, I know you wrote your book for people who are not savvy in those things and are maybe hearing this going, I don't know how to navigate a conversation like mm -hmm. Greg just did. But the point is when somebody says, believing God is a science stopper, you could say, what do you mean by science? Mm -hmm. Is it purely the search for naturalistic explanations. Well, then you asked a great question back. What if the thing we need to explain, like DNA or the origin of the universe, mm -hmm. doesn't have a naturalistic explanation? How do you know from the beginning of your journey that this phenomena can be explained solely through science? Right. That seems to presume the thing that we want to know. Right. So by asking questions, we can narrow down on what do we mean by science. Mm -hmm. And it also seems to me, why assume, are there any other things we know that are apart from science? Of course, we could talk about that. Right. The other right. question it seems to me some could ask is, believe in God is a science stopper. Can you give me some examples of when science uh when belief in God stopped science from oh. advancing. Mm -hmm. So oh, that's now, I don't a good wanna, one. And I, and I don't want to debate the particulars, but I want to mm -hmm. know, like you said, I want to get information and see what they're thinking. So mm -hmm. by the way, from our side, we don't have to show that there's no examples of belief in God stopping science. There probably are some examples and we're happy to concede those. But is it by its nature a science stopper? Right. That's the heart of the claim. Mm -hmm. So I want to know what they're thinking. And then we could go the kind of philosophical route that you went or the fact-based route, which says, wait a minute, just look historically speaking. Has belief in God stopped science or right. has it developed it? And from the leading scientific pioneers throughout a range of disciplines that you've talked about, Jay Warner Wallace documents in his recent book, it's actually factually mistaken. And that's right. So that's right. So there's a couple of things to comment about that, uh, Sean. Um, there's a great summary, by the way, and uh, the what, what it shows uh, once again is there's um, lots of directions to go in any particular issue, and it does show if you want to be productive with your questions, you have to know some stuff. Okay, mm. this is why a tremendous amount of the book, mm. certainly the beginning, the first three quarters of every chapter dealing with an issue is really to lay the foundation to give the content to the reader to help them to know, okay, now you understand what's wrong with the view. Then we move into questions. We've just jumped into the questions here in our conversation, but the content is there in the book provided so they have the understanding. But let's just say, you know, people are taking a shot, they're getting into conversations, they start asking questions to draw a person out, and they don't know where to go, mm. how to deal with the issue. No problem. You had an educational experience by asking questions of the other person, and they offer their point of view. 
probably with more clarity than if you had not asked the questions and you've gotten an education about their view. Now you can, you know, on your own at your leisure, when the pressure is off, you can do a little research to help you out. Mm. Um, this is why I think with this kind of approach, Sean, there are no failures. There, there's no like, oh, that was a failed enterprise because I didn't know the answer. This presumes you're not going to know all the answers. I don't know all the answers, mm. okay? And and so, I mean, none of us do. But what what we can do is have a conversation that draws another person out in a friendly fashion and see what happens. And if nothing else happens but that we let them talk about their view and mm. uh, flesh out their objections a little bit more um, thoroughly, then what we've done is we've gotten an education on their objection. And on our own, we can then find out more information about dealing with that. This is a learning process. You, mm. you start at the beginning and you just test the waters. And as time goes on, you'll be able to incorporate some questions that are in the book to move the conversation a little further forward than you did before. And as time goes on, you're gonna learn more and more and more. You and I went through the same MA philosophy program together there at, at we Talbot. Did. And I remember JP Moreland saying, you know, when you start out in this thing, nothing's gonna make any sense to you. It's all gonna sound like a bunch of gobbledygook, you know, you stick with it, you stay with it. And pretty soon things begin to come into focus. And then you start understanding bits and pieces and you'll, that's going to happen. And of course it did, you know, we learn the language, you learn a few things and we, we, we see how thinking works. And a lot of this confused stuff starts taking organized shape. And the same thing is true here. There's a lot of area out here to cover lots of challenges. So we, we enter in in the shallow end of the pool. We've got a couple of questions in our pocket that allow us to probe and get more information from the other person. We, uh, as we study more material, we realize, hey, how can an atheist make a claim, a moral claim against God when he doesn't even have a foundation for morality in his own worldview? We learn that. Oh, okay, I got that. Now, now I can ask a question that exploits that weakness. It's little by little by little process. But I think people are going to be amazed at how effective they are going to be compared to the way, certainly the way they used to be when they start learning some of the material and taking the, the tactical game plan into the streets. So make it make a distinction for me, Greg. How much are the questions just to understand and learn versus to advance a particular idea? And maybe this is a difference between Columbo question one and question three that you're talking about. So, for example, yes. your your question uh, to me a minute ago when we were role playing was something to the effect of seeing information and the genetic code. You know, how does this get there without a mind? Something to mm -hmm. that effect. Sure. And I was going to respond and say, wait a minute, this is begging the question. You are loading the question by assuming that things like this need a mind. Now, that would have been maybe how I pushed back. So mm -hmm. are you asking questions because you know you have certain conviction, you have certain beliefs about the Bible, and these questions are to advance to the point that you are trying to make? Or are these just questions to understand? Well, um, actually, I, there, I think there's more going on than those two things. They are questions okay. to understand, okay? But in my understanding, when I get a clear picture of what the person is doing uh, or what they believe, okay, now I'm in a position to ask myself, okay, do I have an avenue here based on what I know to use more questions to show a weakness or a flaw, okay? And if somebody would have brought up that point that you just offered, for example, that, uh, well, you're just loading it with your question, you know, who wrote the book? Um, and that's circular reasoning. I'm going to say, well, wait a minute, are you saying, Sean, that it's not appropriate for me to ask who wrote this book? This is a book, mm -hmm. right? Isn't that an appropriate question for this kind of information? This is the kind of information in the DNA double helix. Why isn't that an appropriate question? of the DNA double helix. Okay, so notice how I am making a point. I'm parrying your challenge that I'm being circular, but I'm putting it in question form, okay? So like we said earlier, there's a lot going on in conversations like this and a lot of different angles to pursue. But I am asking questions to get information so I know where to go next, if I can go next to another point. I'm also asking questions to get them 
to articulate their view more okay. clearly. Now, the disadvantage of doing this with you, Sean, is you've got a lot of, you know a lot of stuff, and you've talked with a lot of very educated atheists and people who have been around the block a few times, okay? Most people who object to Christianity are not like that. That's why when you ask a question, mm. for clarification's sake, you'll get, well, what I call it is the Simon and Garfunkel response. Remember those guys from the 60s and 70s? I they don't remember song. them, just for the record, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. I do. I was there. They wrote a song in 1960. They're still alive, by the way, but they're very old. They wrote a song in 1966 called The Sounds of Silence. Right. So when you ask a clarification question of some people, most people, about what they've challenged, you get The Sounds of Silence back. You get dead air because they don't know how to clarify their view. They haven't, they haven't worked through that. This is why the, the Columbo number one and number two, what do you mean by that? What is your view? Clarify this for me. And what are your reasons for your view? These are really powerful. Even though the book really is mostly about the third step, mm. these are always initial questions that get you going into a conversation and put you at a tremendous advantage. Because when they answer those questions, if they can, they have clarified the view, not only for you, but also for themselves. And I'll tell you, it, uh, I could give you lots of stories of times sure. when I've just asked basic questions for clarification's mm. sake, and people realize that their view is not very, very well thought out. I just ask, mm. what do you mean by that? Or clarify for me what, well, they, they just can't get to it. Now this shows the power of cultural socialization. Uh, the culture has these challenges that are thrown out, you know, and uh, it's like, you know, there are contradictions in the Bible. So what? I'm making the case that Jesus is the Messiah, he rose from the dead. Contradictions in the Bible, so what? N now, you were able to give a, a little bit more substantive response, but a lot of people won't be able to respond to that because they think, well, you're dead in the water if there's contradictions in the Bible. No, we're not. All we have to have is a real Jesus who lived mm. and died and rose again. That's what we've got to have. You know, we don't even need a Bible. Um, and, so, and so these are the kinds of points that I'm, I'm going to try to make. And it, my encouragement, too, is that people uh, who are listening just step into the shallow end of the pool, armed with a couple of questions, just to begin the process of conversation. Hmm. And it's amazing what they're going to learn. They're going to learn two things. First of all, they're going to learn that people are not as scary as they thought. OK, sometimes we, we the the objector is like giants in our own eyes. You know, we're grasshoppers. They're giants, you know, kind of thing like the, the, the spies there in the book of numbers. Mm. Um, and we're also going to find out that they're not as smart as we thought. Now, I'm not saying they're dumb, but um, it's very easy for us to, to to think they must have much better reasons than they actually do have. And when we start talking to them, we realize that's it. That's what you got? Wow, that's not so scary. And that's one of the reasons that just talking to them and hearing their side can be really helpful. Hmm. That's great. Well, let me say one thing to our viewers who've stayed with us. Part of my challenge in this, you and I didn't know how this conversation was going to go, <laughs> is I didn't want to push back too much on these and sidetrack the conversation as a steel man argument might, because then we wouldn't be able to focus on some of the tactics that you're teaching but also didn't want to just be a pushover, wanted to add a few objections back to keep right. the conversation going. But you're right, most people, it was Frank Pastore, he said, I'll have a caller ask one question, but once you ask a question back on his radio show, he goes, very few people would have depth. And I remember That's an example right. from your training, I was having lunch with a friend, and he's gone affirming on LGBTQ, and he nicely said, he goes, man, Sean, I didn't realize you were so homophobic. And I just said, can you help me understand what you mean by homophobia? Right. And Greg, he couldn't even define it. And I thought, wow, mm -hmm. I said, you just called me a name. Right, right. And you can't define it. So I do want to reiterate in Tactrics and in this book, Street Smart, Street Smarts, you just give some great strategies for any conversation. You don't have to be Greg. You don't have to be me. You just That's learn right. these basic things. And you can make some remarkable ground in conversation 
but then just keep getting better. So, mm-hmm. you know, I endorse it. Huge fan of tactics. We love when you come teach this class at Biola Forest. Huge fan of your latest book, Street Smarts. I don't have a real version yet, but I've printed this out and I've marked it all up. <laughs> yeah, we Third. sent you the file and uh, I actually just hey. saw the cover work uh, today and it looks really good. So I'm good. really thrilled about when it's coming out. Well, you should be. It's an excellent book and I want to commend it to our viewers. And while they're at it, make sure you hit subscribe here. We've got lots of other conversations coming up on some fascinating apologetic conversations. And if you want to take a class with Greg on tactics or join me in a master's program, we'd love to have you at Biola. Or if you're not ready yet for a master's program, we have a certificate program where we'll guide you through some apologetics training. There's a significant discount code below. Greg, this is a lot of fun, man. This is a unique conversation. <laughs> have never done it quite like this. I hope people mm-hmm. like it. I had fun. Seems like you had fun. So it's a win in I my did. book. Thanks for coming I on. Did. You're welcome, brother. You too.